family, I want to welcome you to this week's Bible Enrichment. I, I think if there's ever a time that we should be studying the Word of God together, it's during this turbulent moment we're in. The Word of God, which answers every question we have. It, it provides strength where we're weak. It gives us peace because of the knowledge of the forefathers we have walked through massive times of captivity and desolate moments and weakness. And sometimes what your Lord is just saying to us, can I get you to study for an hour? Just one hour. And so tonight, I, I want you to join us. I want you to be part of it. I want you to have a good time with us. And I want you to get your pen, get your paper, and let's go into the Word of God. Let's find ourselves. As the word of the Lord said, studying to show yourself approved, rightly dividing this word. And so we do know that when we're in pain, it is part of our promise. This is Pastor. Let's go to class. Because you never let me die. With everything that's been going on, this has to be said.
amazing God we have. He never lets us down. Regardless of our circumstances, and so many of us have cried out, Lord, why hast thou forsaken me? And the Lord has said to you, I will never leave nor forsake you. Matter of fact, in the time of trouble, I hide you. I've been good to you. I've been faithful to you. I brought you through another few days, a moment of time. And so we just bless the Lord for all of you that are with us on this evening. My favorite scripture, David said it, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in this day. And so we honor God for what he's doing, what he's saying, what he has been to you, what he shall do for you and with you and through you. And so we honor the Lord for your faithfulness unto him. We're going to ask you this evening, just invite someone um, to come to service with us. I know the sun is still shining on the West Coast and many of you are wondering are we going to start later when it gets dark we're going to be finished by the time it gets dark so we need you to just jump in with us and to be part of this amazing wednesday word we're going to ask you to be part of it we're going to ask you to engage and be part of get your notebook prepare yourself to write a note to yourself i believe god has something he wants to say to you and to be an encouragement to you your family your children and to all that are with you god is that type of god and i praise him and magnify tonight his great name if you're ready for pastor to begin our teaching series why don't you send up some hearts let me know i keep telling you uh, those of you that have been joining pastor on tuesday talks when he turn the talks on tuesday I typically say if I get five hearts, I get started and I start teaching and I get right in and get out. And those of you that did not join me on this past Tuesday, I want you to go back to pastor's page and just log on to there and just see, in fact, if something was said that would be an encouragement to you. And I want you to do that on this week. Would you do that and invite a friend and then to be part of it with you and to um, be encouraged do you ever need to be in inspired or encouraged let's go that way do you ever have a day that you need encouragement you need someone to encourage you speak well of you someone that zeroes in on where you are and just begins to uh, tell you don't be weary in well-doing, because in due season you'll reap if you faint not. So I want you, if you will, I believe this week's Turn of Talks has a message in it for you. Uh, I want you to zero in in there and like it, share it, share it, like it, forward it off to someone else. It's just a few minutes. It's not a sermon, but I believe it's a word that will be an inspiration for you and so we praise the lord for those of you that continue to be with us uh, on tuesday those that joined us on the um prayer call on monday and then those of certainly that are with us tonight we want you again get your bibles not only have a bible but i want you to get your notebook so you can take some notes uh, we have been talking about rebuilding our faith. We've been talking about the glory of God. And tonight I want to begin section three of this class, Restoring Glory in the House in God's house. How do we restore the glory in God's house? What happened to it? Why do we come to the house of the Lord? Would you realize and believe that you can be a contributor to restoration in the house of God? 
that you really could be a contributor to having the glory of God rest upon this house. And I know you're saying that's somebody else's job, but I'm going to share with you scripture tonight that shows that God has commissioned you to be a contributor to the restoration of glory in his house. Somebody say, I'm ready. Somebody say, I'm ready. All right, let me see a note at home. I want somebody to tell someone tonight, I am ready. I'm ready to be a contributor to the majestic glory of God that dwells in his house. The majestic glory of God that dwells in his house. And can I tell you something? There's nothing like the glory of God. There is nothing like the power and the glory of God when it rests upon the believer. And I want you to be so blessed by it that you say to the Lord, I'm ready to be used by you to be a contributor to the glory of God resting in your house. Amen. Amen. Let's go to our Old Testament writing tonight. Prophetic writing. The book of Hey Guy. Hey Guy. Hey Guy. Hey Guy. H A G G A I. Hey, guy. We give you that to you tonight. We want you to get into your Bibles. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Hey, guy. Chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading at verse 1. Through 9. When you have that in your Bibles, could you say amen? Amen. Thank you. Only one of you at home sent a note in saying the Lord has commissioned you to be a contributor. Ah, home people, those of you that have the luxury of joining us from your comforts of your home, we need you to engage with us tonight. This is an engaging lesson, and I want you to be a part of it. Amen. The book of Haggai, chapter 2, and begin reading at verse number 1. The Bible says, in the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Hey, gay, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Josh, Dash, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, I want you to please highlight verse 2 because we're going to come back to that. The question the prophet is asking, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as nothing? Verse 4, yet be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of John, Jodash, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people 
of the land, saith the Lord. And then watch what he says. And work. Be strong and work. Be strong and work. You missed, you missed that part, didn't you? Who did he tell to work? The people. Be strong and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word of that, I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus is the Lord of hosts. Yet once. It is a little while. And I will shake the heavens. And I will. And the earth. And the sea. And the dry land. And I will shake all nations. And the desire of all nations shall come. And I will feel, and I, God, will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. I, God, alone will fill this house with glory. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Then he says, and the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. In this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. What a powerful reading this is. Amen to the reading of the word. This prophet in three small chapters delivers a most powerful, prominent message to people that have been dispersed that have been held in captivity, that have been spit upon, that have been abused, and they had no inclination, how will this end? Have you ever been in a personal battle and you've wondered, how will this end? Will it end? Can it end? Will I live long enough to see it end? Tonight I want you to look at this writing by a prophet that's been commissioned by Yahweh or the God of Israel. That's just one of the names that he gave himself, the people of God gave him. He's God the creator. There's only one. And what he's saying is, I am Yahweh, your God. I am entire. I don't have another God beside me. There's no help that I need from any man or woman. Because I am self-sufficient. He is sovereign in all of his being. He doesn't have to ask anyone for permission. He just simply exists because he's God. God is God. Lest you forget, at times... When you're feeling dispersed, when you're feeling in exile, you're feeling hopeless. Somebody just put a note in there from the home class. God is still God. Could you just type that in your comment? God is just still God. God is God. 
And God, the God of Israel, commissions Hege to prophesy to his people. Now, he's God, and he selects a prophet to send a message to the same people that had questions, God, will you ever deliver me? Will you ever help me? God has a messenger for you. God always has a messenger for us. The word of the Lord said, he that have an ear to hear, let him hear what saith the Lord. And what does God use when he wants to deliver a message? A messenger. He sent Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses was a messenger. For those of you that keep discounting how God works, God is a spirit, and yet he knows all things. He's omniscient. He knows all things, and he knows what messenger to choose to bring you the answer to the question that is prevailing in your mind. What was the question, Pastor, that Israel had? Well, first of all, they have been in exile for 70 long years. Um, being in exile is not something you want to experience because what it means is an enemy comes and forcibly overtakes you and makes you leave what was your territory, what was your home, what was your place of business, your land, your promise, your future. Now you are not on vacation, you are an exile. We see this going on right now in the war that's going on in Ukraine, they're talking about there's now 5 million individuals that they don't call them vacationists, they are exiles. They have been forcibly removed by an adversary to a land that they didn't even choose to be in. The children of Israel were captive by the Babylonians and forced to live in captivity, not because they desired to be there, but because, watch this, God allowed it to be so. The Lord is looking for individuals that has a desire to tell the Lord, I'm ready to see a miracle. Rubbish is everywhere. Remember when uh, <laughs> Nehemiah went into uh, Jerusalem to build the wall. He said, the first thing I found was what? Garbage everywhere. He said, the ruins were so bad. I had to move all of that before I could even find where the wall should be. Trash had built up for all of this time. And when you see ruins... I don't know if you watched any of the news and, and you've seen pictures of all of the bombing and that goes on and you're trying to think somebody used to live there. That used to be somebody's house. That used to be a store. That used to be. And, and have you ever just drawn, gone through your neighborhood or a neighborhood and you see it all boarded up? It makes you heavy, doesn't it? It's It's discouraging. It's disparaging. 
And here comes God. Isn't it amazing? For those of you that are in moments of deep darkness and depression, <laughs> you're almost asking the Lord, would you lay down with me and cry with me? Because, Lord, you got to see what I see. And the Lord is saying, I'm not that kind of God. I want to prepare you for miracles. God wants to prepare us for miracles. Matter of fact, what God is saying, I need you to start looking at rubbish and ruins with an anticipation of restoration. I don't want you to keep looking at it as it's impossible. That there's nothing that's good going to come out of this. That it's over, the end. This is a wrap. God is saying to us, if you look at the prophetic word that uh, uh, Hagar gives, he says, God told me to speak to you. I didn't come of my own will, but I've been sent by God to speak to the builder, to speak to the leader, and then speak to the prop, the people. And you know what he's saying? For all that are ready to see a miracle, prepare yourself. Because whenever God sends a prophetic word, you've got to know a miracle is right behind it. Whenever God sends a prophetic word, whenever God uses a prophet, that's why, no, nah, I'm not going to go there tonight. You know, the Lord don't go, well, yeah, yeah, thus, 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 say it, say it, say it. No. What did he say? He said, I need you to go speak to them. Make it clear to them. Make it clear to Zerubbabel, the builder, the one that I commissioned. Because there are times when you are anticipating what God has given you direction to do, you have questions. You're wondering, Lord, should I do it or did I make this up? Where did this come from? And the Lord is saying, you know my voice. Why not take heed of what I tell you? Let's see if I can get somebody to put that down there. I know his voice. See, you know God's voice, and you know when God speaks to you, and you know when, even though it sounds uh, impossible, what did the Lord tell the prophet to do? Go to him, and I want you to speak to them what I say to you. <laughs> now, what's this, ladies and gentlemen? Jerusalem's ruins are historic. They're affecting every realm of life. Their commerce has come to an end. Their community is upside down. Society has been dispersed. And can I tell you something else? The church, the temple itself was desolate. It had been destroyed. And what it was destroyed physically, but spiritually, there's a remnant of hope. Even when something seems to be destroyed physically, you've got to know that God is able to restore it greater than it's ever been. Am I talking to anybody tonight? Am I speaking to anyone tonight? The restoration power of God is so magnificent that in fact, what you see as death, he sees as better. What you see as hopeless, he sees as miracles. And so he's telling, hey, gay, go tell them what I say. And I want you to know something, that when Jerusalem's ruins have come to bear, in our lives, there are times it seems like everything is turned upside down. It is affecting your commerce, your finance, your community, your society. Sleepless nights. 
Don't know where they come from. And we've all had them. Had them. And what the Lord is saying, trust me. Go speak to these people. Trust me. Can I tell you why destruction came? You ready? Have you ever seen it? Mass destruction. Destruction is a means to darken your faith. Destruction. When it comes about, it seeks to darken your faith. It wants to create what pastor calls mental distractions. It wants you to be wondering, full of anxiety, fear. It wants to weaken the spiritual and natural economy of every believer. Destruction. It seeks to weaken your spiritual and your natural economy. Because you do know when you're spiritually in tune with God, you are rich. When you are tied into God spiritually, you are rich. The word, the word says that earth is the Lord and the fullness there is of uh, there is. When you are spiritually tied into God, on, on point with God, a bill doesn't send you off the dark end. A delay or a pause doesn't make you feel God doesn't love you. When you are spiritually tuned into God, you simply look at your trial, your test, and you simply say, God is up to something. God's getting ready to do something. All this hell and confusion is not here for not. God is about to do something in my life. And may I get somebody at home just to put that in your comment section? God's about to do something. Somebody, just ebonically, just God's about to do something. How do you know, Pastor? Because it looks like destruction and ruins everywhere I turn. And what I want you to know, that God is about to do something. He's already sent a prophet to tell you, be strong. Why? Because you are the remnant of the people that are about to receive and see a miracle. A miracle's coming. Jerusalem is undergoing a massive reconstruction following a total elimination of its resources. Heaven entered into grieving began grieving once it saw his people in captivity. I can tell you, heaven does not rejoice when you're in trial. Heaven is not excited about the tears that you cry. Heaven does not get any glory out of the pain of your ulcer or whatever physical realm that you experience that does not give God glory. It doesn't give him pleasure. It doesn't satisfy him to see his beloved in the hands of a captive, an evil man, an evil spirit. And so for 70 years, the Lord is, he's observing all of his people in captivity. But can I tell you something? From day one to the end, he's making a way of escape for you. The Lord is making plans because your ladder is going to be greater than your former. The Lord is up to something in your life. I, I want somebody to hear me tonight. The Lord is up to something in your life. And it's not death. 
He would not be sending a prophet down there to tell him, go dig a grave. He doesn't tell him to dig a grave. He doesn't tell Joshua, dig a grave. He doesn't tell Zerubbabel to dig a grave. And he doesn't say it to the people, get ready, you're about to die. But I want to tell you what he's saying. I need the people that are about to be delivered. I want them to have a moment where they reflect upon why am I here? Would you do that for a moment? Those of you that are in some adversarial position, would you just reflect on a moment? Why are you there? What did you do? Did you do anything to contribute to this captivity? Or are you totally free? What did you do? Uh, did you take the grace of God for granted? Maybe. Did you underestimate how long grace would last before it would be withdrawn? Because when you abuse the grace of God, what you're saying is, I don't need protection. And God is saying, who else can protect you like me? Who loves you like I do? Who cares for you like I do? And so what I'm saying to you, you can't walk away from God and not experience some repercussions. There's got to be an impact when you don't trust God. When you have walked away from God, your faith becomes weak. The financial perils of life begin to overtake you. When you have walked away from God, you diminish the power of fellowship. You become discouraged. Leaders discourage. Leaders following those that were not called to lead. Leaders giving up their responsibility to lead. And when you start doing this, there becomes a massive need to rebuild in the house of God. The house of God is in a reconstruction season. It's undergoing a need. I want you to assess it in your own mind, in your own spirit. You've been with the Lord long enough and do you see a need for reconstruction? Could we as a body of believers be proactive? Could we as believers understand that God is still a healer? I had an early morning text from a pastor, a friend of mine, all the way in Miami, talking about, Bishop, please pray with my father. Another man, a bishop, a leader, diagnosed with cancer. Another one. What I'm saying in the body of Christ, when the glory of God began to move in the temple, there was no need to spend years in chemotherapy. There was no need for others to spend years in dialysis. <laughs> Why, Pastor? Because the glory of God would rest in the house and it would cause miracles to take place. And I know some of you are saying, Pastor, you don't believe in doctors? I've got three of them. 
I got a dentist, I got a medical doctor, and I got another doctor. But what I'm saying is, I don't put my confidence in him, but what I put my confidence is, is when I can get to the presence of God and his glory rest upon me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. Healing can take place. And I think it's time for the believers, those of you that are undergoing whatever you're undergoing, whether it's financial, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, with your children, your family, your marriages, whatever it might be. I believe it's time for us, the church, the church, to usher the glory of God back into his house. And tell those that are sick and can say, with his stripes I've been healed. Those that are blinded, they can say, now I can see. Those that were lame, now I can walk. And what does the enemy want to do? He wants to decommission the house of God and say that it really doesn't matter while those around us are dying needlessly. There's so many that are in exile spiritually in exile prayer intercessors warriors and those that should be able to sit among us i remember when i was coming up there were people that they would call had discerning spirits could be in the house of god and you didn't want to sit on their road not unless you wanted to be delivered because when you sit on that road the spirit of deliverance would come across those chairs touch you next thing you know deliverance was come the church has to be in a, what I call, a season of rebuilding now. Rebuilding is not an easy process because you got to move the rubbish out of the way. Rebuilding. You got to get the garbage. You got to clear the garbage. You got to clear the garbage. And there's somebody, you know... <laughs> You know, with your children, you know how it is. You tell them, would you throw the garbage out? You know, and they'll get through eating and whatever it is, they'll leave the McDonald's, they'll leave the paper right there and just walk away from it. And you just, oh, my God. And you know what you say? Are they ever going to learn? And God is saying the same thing to us as believers. You get up, you walk away from all the miracles that he's given you, and he's saying, will they ever learn? Well, they throw the trash away, the doubt, the worry, the anxiety, the lack of worship, the lack of praise. Well, they throw that away and make room for the miracle that I'm about to give them. Can I talk about war for a minute? War is vile. It destroys the infrastructure and it, and it contaminates life's ecosystem war every time you hear what's going on in this nation of war they're talking about we have no running water we have no gas it's called destroying the ecosystem that which is necessary for life the enemy wants to destroy the spiritual ecosystem that which we need, you need, I need, we need. What do we need? We need fellowship. We need two or three gathered together in his name, touching and agree so that miracles are going to begin to rest. And if you don't need it, your sister needs it. If she doesn't need it, there's a man that needs it. If that's not true, there's some teenagers that need it. knew it would get quiet now <laughs> spiritual war is vile it destroys vision it takes away hope it, it interrupts faith and what it does to leaders it makes leaders tepid when there's a spiritual war 
I'm not going to talk about the Barna report that came across this morning that talked about the number of pastors that are walking away still. And how many have considered it? They did say there's a remnant that says, even though I'm facing all that I'm facing, my commitment to God won't let me walk away. There is somebody watching this class tonight. You've got a greater commitment to God, and you need to just tell the Lord, regardless of what I'm facing, nothing that I'm facing is going to make me walk away from the assignment that's on my life. Paul declares that we war against the members of our minds. And when we're warring against the members of our minds, our thoughts, the Bible speaks in Romans 7 and 23, it brings me back into captivity. He said, I see another law, warring against the members of my mind, bringing me back into captivity. Then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Israel had been in warfare to the point that they became captives. Isn't it amazing? What I'm loving, not about the war, but the fighting of those soldiers who the other party had underestimated. Didn't think they could survive this long. Didn't think these young people would be this strong. How many times have the adversary underestimated you? He thought cancer would take you out. He thought trouble would take you out. He thought this would take you out. And what he didn't realize, your commitment to God is deeper and stronger than he could imagine. What did he say on three occasions? When you're going through reconstruction, it goes beyond brick and mortar. Reconstruction of the glory of God is not dealing with the physical elements of a building. But it's dealing and it's stronger because what I want to tell you, the building is no stronger than its residents. Did you hear that? A building is no stronger than its residents. Because if you don't take care of a building, it's going to fall down. The residents have to put the energy inside of it in order to sustain it. I dare you not to put some fresh paint on it. I dare you not to vacuum the carpet. What you're going to find is over time, that which was standing will crumble. What God is saying in my house, occasionally I got to bring you back in and I got to remove some things off of you. And then I got to renew in you a right spirit because I need you to stand. I need you to stand when nobody else can stand. I need you to stand. He says, Zerubbabel, be strong. Joshua, be strong. People, be strong. In other words, Zerubbabel, I want you to take courage while you're building. I need you to be strong while you're building. Joshua, I want you to be strong while you're teaching. And people, I want you to be strong while you're hearing God give you direction. Who among us can tell the Lord, I need some strength tonight? Hmm. Bring him back to the glory of God in the house. You need to simply say, Lord, I'm going to let you do it. I'm going to let you fill this house because he asked the question, who among you has seen this house in her former glory? And how do you see it now? <laughs> how do you see it now and what the Lord is saying to you and I that he 
He needs you to participate in the reconstruction of his house until the glory falls. And I want to finish with this writing from David in Psalm 51 and 10. With the David say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. Why, Lord? Because I don't want you to cast me from your presence and take thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. There's that word again, rest. Restore in me the joy. How many believers have you run across that haven't even spoke about joy in a while? Haven't rejoiced in a moment. The church <laughs> could take something away from the NBA playoffs. They go in there and they make a joyful noise. Just to somebody running up and down the court. And when we come to the house of God and in his presence, we ought to be making a joyful noise unto the Lord. He says, when you restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, uphold me with thy Holy Spirit. He says, teach transgressors the way. And sinners shall be coveted unto thee, converted unto thee. He says, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God, O my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall sing forth praises. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I have given it to you, a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. What does he want? He wants your heart. He wants the tenderness of your love tonight. He wants you to give that sacred thing that dwells inside of you. Would you tonight rededicate yourself to the Lord? Simply tell the Lord, make me strong whether i'm zerubbabel make me strong if i'm a builder make me a strong builder if i'm a leader if i'm a joshua make me strong and lord god if i'm no one else but the people the people that you love, would you make me stronger? The Lord needs you to be strong tonight. Are you willing, are you able to restore glory back into the house of God? Would you do it? Would you just lift your hands with me? Pastor's going to pray for his presence to rest upon this house. Whew, Jesus. Lord, let your presence rest upon this house. Lord God, would you come touch the hearts of your people? Send a prophetic word to us, Lord God, that we need. Let it rest upon us. Father, David said, create in me a clean heart. Could you renew in me a right spirit? Father, your house needs to be full of your glory, your power, your might. <laughs> There's a broken marriage that needs to be healed. Lord, there's a family that's dispersed.
that needs reconciliation. There's a son not speaking to a mother. There's a mother with a broken heart. Father, with all this brokenness in the house, could you use your people to lift their hands until the glory falls again? Father, you said to Hagar to just speak to them. <laughs> and so tonight, Lord, I'm speaking to them. I'm speaking to their hearts. I'm reminding them how good you have been to them. I'm reminding them of your word that you said you would never leave nor forsake. And in the time of trouble, God, you hide us. God, you're hiding us tonight. Lord, let miracles, signs, and wonders come into your house again. Father, I know what the social media says that there's no power, no need for God. But God, we need you like never before. Let your spirit rest upon us. Let your glory rest upon us, Lord. Would you let it fall fresh upon us, God? Hallelujah. And you said in your word, God, you would fill this house with your glory. That there would be no lack among us. And Father, we thank you right now for sending finance, sending favor, Sending faith, sending power, sending praise, sending glory. How you go, God? We thank you. Send it into your house, God. When we walk through the doors, we'll feel your presence. We'll know, ha! Huh, shout a whole God. There's nobody like you. We search high, Lord God. We won't give up. We won't give in. We'll trust you. We'll believe you. We'll know, Father. Uh, God, that you'll look in your house and you'll say, these are my beloved whom I'm well pleased with. And Father, we're going to give you glory like never before. We're going to magnify your great name. We're going to stand still and watch you make the lame to walk again. We're going to watch you, Lord God. Put the tax money in the mouth of the fish. We're going to watch you, Lord God. Heal. And align spines and back problems and the things that have been troubling your people, Lord God. Somebody with a sciatic nerve. Somebody, Lord God, with blood pressure. Somebody else, Lord God, taking chemo. Whoever might be sick among us. Father, let your glory fall. Let your glory fall in the house. Let your glory fall in the house. Oh, shut up. Hey, can I tell you somebody that the glory is falling? The glory is falling in the house. The glory is falling in this house. The glory is falling in your house. Uh, somebody, just, hey God, just tell God, thank you for the glory. Thank you for the power. Thank you for the majestic power. The majestic power dominion and power let it rest upon us god we thank you and you said not only would you come into the house but you would fill this house with your glory god we thank you we thank you